Point prevalence is simply the total cases in the population at a given time divided by the total population at risk at the same time. The total cases include both new and old cases. The incidence of a disease is slightly different. It is defined as the number of new cases in a population over a given period of time, divided by the total population at risk during that time. Thus, incidence describes new cases, while prevalence describes old and new cases. Also, when calculating incidence, people who are not at risk for acquiring the disease are omitted. This includes people currently with the disease, as well as people previously with the disease for conditions that cannot be acquired multiple times. Roughly speaking, the prevalence is approximately equal to the incidence times the disease duration. Thus, for chronic diseases like diabetes, the prevalence will be greater than the incidence because there are a large number of existing cases. For acute diseases, like the common cold, prevalence is approximately equal to incidence because almost all cases are new cases. Let's review what we discussed earlier regarding quantifying risk. I'll also introduce a different way of thinking about and calculating the various risk parameters by using a handy 2x2 risk factor versus disease table. Do you remember what type of study uses the odds ratio? That would be case control studies. The odds ratio is formally defined as the odds of exposure to the risk factor in the disease group divided by the odds of exposure to the risk factor in the non-disease group. Looking at this 2x2 table, we can see that the odds of exposure in the disease group is given by a divided by A plus C over C divided by A plus C. Similarly, the odds of exposure in the non-disease group is B divided by B plus D over D divided by B plus D. Simplifying this expression for the odds ratio yields AD over BC. Recall that the odds ratio approximates the relative risk if the prevalence of the disease is not too high. Here's another question for you. What type of study uses relative risk as a measure of association? That's right, the answer is cohort studies. The relative risk is formally defined as the relative probability of getting a disease in the exposed group compared to the unexposed group. It is calculated as the fraction with disease in the exposed group divided by the fraction with disease in the unexposed group. From the table, we see that the relative risk is calculated as A divided by A plus B over C divided by C plus D. Now let's discuss some other important parameters used for quantifying risk. The attributable risk is the difference in risk between the exposed and unexposed groups, or the proportion of disease occurrences that are attributable to the exposure. The attributable risk is calculated as A divided by A plus B minus C divided by C plus D, as given by the 2x2 two two table. For example, if the probability of getting pneumonia for smokers is two-thirds, while that for non-smokers is one-third, we could conclude that the proportion of pneumonia occurrences attributable to smoking is two-thirds minus one-third, which equals one-third. The absolute risk reduction is the decrease in risk associated with an experimental treatment as compared to a placebo or control treatment. The attributable risk and the absolute risk reduction are important because they are used to calculate the number needed to treat and the number needed to harm. The number needed to treat is 1 divided by absolute risk reduction, and the number needed to harm is 1 divided by the attributable risk. The number needed to treat and number needed to harm are commonly tested principles on the exam. You can think of the number needed to treat as the number of people you would need to give an experimental treatment to prevent one person from getting the disease of interest. In contrast, the number needed to harm is the number of people you would need to expose to a risk factor in order to cause one person to acquire the disease of interest. In colloquial language, we often use precision and accuracy interchangeably, but they mean very different things from a statistical standpoint. Precision is the consistency and reproducibility of a test, and it also sometimes is referred to as reliability. In contrast, accuracy is a measure of how close test measurements are to the true value, and is sometimes referred to as validity. A precise test may not be accurate, and an accurate test may not be precise. Let's look at some examples that illustrate this concept. In the first diagram on the left, the data points are widely scattered, but their average is centered on the bullseye, which represents the true value. Thus, this test is accurate, but not precise. In the second diagram, the data is tightly clustered, but off-center, so the test is precise, but not accurate. In the third diagram, the data is tight and centered, so the test is both accurate and precise. Finally, the last diagram shows widely scattered and off-center data corresponding to a test that is neither accurate nor precise. 
Random error is basically the antithesis of precision. It reduces the consistency and reproducibility of a test. On the other hand, systematic error reduces the accuracy of a test by consistently skewing results in a particular direction and thereby reducing the validity of the test measurements. Understanding the different types of biases that can occur in a study is moderately high yield and worth reviewing. Bias is defined as the situation in which an outcome is systematically favored over another. It therefore causes systematic error. Do you recall what systematic errors reduce? Systematic errors reduce the accuracy of a study. Selection bias is also called Berkson's bias, and it is the non-random assignment of subjects to the study groups. For example, selection bias occurs if only hospitalized patients are used as a control group, or if patients themselves decide which group to enter into. Furthermore, loss to follow-up is a common cause of selection bias in many studies. Recall bias is when the knowledge that a disorder is present affects recall by subjects. For example, if patients are asked about past behaviors like smoking that may have had negative effects, such as during pregnancy, the patients may not remember or report these behaviors accurately. Sampling bias is when subjects are not representative of the population of interest, and thus the results are not generalizable. Late look bias occurs when information is gathered at an inappropriate time. For example, if a survey is used to study a fatal disease, late look bias occurs because only those patients still alive will be able to answer the survey, and data from the entire population of patients who died would be missing. Procedure bias occurs when subjects in different groups are not treated the same. For instance, when more attention is paid to the treatment group, leading to greater compliance with treatment. Confounding bias occurs with two closely associated factors, when the effect of one factor distorts or confuses the effect of the other. Here, the effects of extraneous factors muddle the exposure-disease relationship. Confounding bias can be prevented by matching controls to cases so that they have all the same characteristic except the factor of interest. Lead time bias occurs when early detection is confused with an increase in survival. This type of bias is commonly seen with improved screening. The natural history of the disease is not changed, but early detection makes it appear as though survival is increased. With this type of bias, think about screening tests such as those for cancer. The Pygmalion effect occurs when a researcher's belief in the efficacy of a treatment changes the outcome of the treatment. This is a form of observer bias and can be avoided by having an independent observer interpret experimental outcomes. Finally, the Hawthorne effect occurs when the group being studied changes its behavior because they know they're under observation, sort of like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle of behavioral science biases. There are four main ways to reduce biases in studies. Double-blinded studies can prevent the Pygmalion effect, the Hawthorne effect, and procedure bias. Blinding prevents participants and researchers from influencing the interpretation of outcomes. Placebos can also be used to reduce bias. Crossover studies are those in which each subject acts as their own control, meaning that if group 1 receives a drug and group 2 receives a placebo, at some later point in the study, group 2 would receive the drug and group 1 would receive the placebo. In this way, both group 1 and group 2 act as their own controls, and many different forms of bias are eliminated in this manner. Finally, randomization is very effective at reducing selection bias and confounding bias. Now we will discuss various terms that are used to describe statistical distributions. The normal or Gaussian statistical distribution is bell-shaped, and the mean, median, and mode are all equal. The standard deviation, denoted by the lowercase Greek letter sigma, describes the spread of the data about the mean. As shown in this diagram, for normally distributed data, 68% of the data falls within one standard deviation of the mean, 95% of the data falls within two standard deviations of the mean, and 99.7% of the data falls within three standard deviations of the mean. As an example, if the mean systolic blood pressure of a population is 130 with a standard deviation of 10, how many of a 100-member cohort will have blood pressures greater than 140, assuming a normal Gaussian distribution? We can calculate the number as follows. 140 is one standard deviation above the mean, and we know that 68% of the cohort, or 68 members, will have values within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. Thus, 32 members have values above 140 or below 120. By symmetry, we conclude that 16 members would have systolic blood pressures greater than 140. The standard error of the mean, or SEM, is defined as the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Understanding how SEM differs from standard deviation can be a little tricky. Let's assume that you have a population of interest, but you can't measure everyone in the population. What do you do? 
You select a random sample of a certain size that you assume is representative of the population. Measure them and then find the sample mean. Put these people back into the population and take another random sample of the same size and calculate their sample mean. You can repeat this process as many times as you want. How precisely do these sample means reflect the true population mean? That's where the SEM comes into play. The standard error of the mean measures the spread of the sample means about the true population mean. Recall that SEM is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Therefore, as sample size increases, SEM decreases. Does this make sense? It should, because this tells us that as the sample gets larger, the sample means become better estimates of the true population mean. Shifting gears now, let's talk about deviations from normal distribution. A positive skew in a distribution occurs when there is asymmetry with the tail lying on the right. In these distributions, the mean is greater than the median, which in turn is greater than the mode. A negative skew in a distribution occurs when there is asymmetry with the tail lying on the left. In these distributions, the mean is less than the median, which in turn is less than the mode. In both positive and negative skew distributions, the median is a better measure of central tendency than either the mean or the mode. Also, in all distributions, the mode is the most resistant to outliers in the sample, whereas the mean, standard deviation, variance, and range of the distribution are all very sensitive to outliers. The median is only slightly more affected by outliers than the mode. If the reasons for these statements are not immediately clear, spend some time thinking about them based on the definition of these statistical terms. Let's continue now with statistical hypotheses, which allow us to determine whether there is a statistically significant difference between two groups. The null hypothesis is the hypothesis of no difference. For example, a medically relevant null hypothesis could be that there is no association between a disease and the risk factor of interest in the population. The alternative hypothesis is the hypothesis that there is a difference, meaning there is some association between the disease and the risk factor in the population. One can create a new 2x2 table with the study results on the vertical axis and the reality of the results on the horizontal axis. Are you starting to see a theme here? When in doubt on a biostatistics question, draw a 2x2 table 